Thank you very much. So I'm going to take a slightly different slant. I've been really interested in what are the long run effects of um, marriage and working and having kids when you start to look at how women age um, over time. And there are a couple of things that are really important as we think about this. One is that life course trajectories are key to understanding well-being in old age. They're actually key to understanding well-being in middle age as well. People don't come to be 60 or 65 or 30 naive. They have like a lifetime of accumulated exposure. And one of the things that we often think about in aging is that what's happened in early childhood is important. Well, it turns out that what happens during early adulthood and family formation is very, very critical during that time. So single parenthood um, experience during early and middle adulthood um, turns out to be associated with long run poor health. We've um, called this, if any of you have heard of the long arm of childhood, we've called it the longish arm, depending if you're from Long Island or not, um, <coughs> longish arm of early adulthood. Um, second, as everybody has shown before me, um, demographic trends suggest trouble down the road. It's not as if we've resolved this and things are getting better. Actually, the rise in single um, motherhood is, you know, as was said, going to reach about 40%. It's something that we really need to think about. The other thing is that policies enacted for the short-term benefits so when we do the earned income tax credit, when we do uh, maternity leave, I'll show you some data, when we um, do things that we think have an immediate effect, it turns out, actually, that if we look at and evaluate those policies over the long run, they also potentially have very beneficial consequences. And these are undercounted. They're actually not counted in any kind of cost-benefit equation that we do. So when we put policies in that are social policies, and they turn out to have health benefits or health benefits down the road, we could accrue a lot more benefits than we're counting now, than OMB is counting, when we think about the value of many of these social and economic um, policies. And I'll show you some of that data. Now, a lot of this work for me started when I was on a National Academy of Science panel um, that looked at diverging trends in life expectancy um, among OECD countries with the idea that suddenly we discovered that women were lagging far, far behind other OECD countries in life expectancy. So the graph that you're looking at shows the red dot is women in the United States, and all the other dots are all other countries. And if you look at kind of 1980s, as a matter of fact, if you go back to 19 or 50s or 60s, the United States was never doing great, but we were solidly in the middle of the pack. We were not doing terribly. And then over time, we have improved. So people ask me all the time, well, hasn't life expectancy improved? Well, it has. It has improved. But not nearly as much as it has improved for women in every other country that we would compare ourselves to. So we've improved slightly over that time. You see the trend going up. But every other country has just gone like this. And actually, the data for men are not all that different. Men don't come out quite as badly as women in this, this stagnation. But um, they don't look terrific either. So what's happened? What's happened between 1980 or 1950s and 60s and now? So this is a big mystery. I would say that at the end of this National Academy of Sciences report, a lot of smart people thought about it a lot. And um, I think the only thing we came up with that made any sense at all is smoking, which I think is true. I think some of these trends are responsible um, um, due to tobacco trends. But that can't explain this whole thing. This, this is a huge mystery. So what else has happened during that time? Um, you've just seen it. So women joined the labor force in very large numbers between um, this period. And if you looked at 1950s, it was about 5%. And now, you know, the vast majority at the top, women with children younger than 18 and on the bottom, um, women with children younger than three are in the labor force. So women are working. On the second one, you see exactly the same um, slide that uh, Dr. Moffat showed, showing the share of births to unmarried women, huge. I don't know. Um, but this has happened in a lot of the countries. So what else hasn't happened in the United States? This is a ranking of former social, um, formal social protection policies. 
um, at a federal level, not to say there aren't individual corporate things, and if you haven't found the United States yet, um, that's because we're like on the bottom right there um, in terms of federal policies. We have um, paid family medical leave, FMLA, but it's unpaid. It belongs to many of you know, about half of workers are eligible. We lag behind every other country. So what I've said is it's almost like a perfect storm. Right? Other countries, um, women haven't joined the workforce, or fertility has dropped way, way down, or they have live in countries with really strong social protection. We have this perfect combination of women joining the workforce in huge numbers, fertility not actually changing very much over this period, and no form of federal and very few state level um, protections to guard against this kind of thing. So we were very interested in what this could be. And I'm going to show you two sets of findings. Um, one of them is about single motherhood, the long run effects of single motherhood. And the second one is about maternity leave, um, comparing European countries. So this is a study on the long run effects of single motherhood um, in terms of late life disability on health. And um, this is a study that was funded from a project from the National Institute of Aging in which we compared US data to a lot of data um, in different countries. We used the Health and Retirement Survey. We used the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. And we used SHARE, which is a survey of health and aging and retirement in Europe. And we looked at women. Now, I want you to remember, because everybody thinks, oh, this is women now. These are young women now. These are older women now. So when they were single mothers, this is like 1950, 1960, 1970, some of them 1940s. You know, it's, a, it's an early era that we're looking at. And we're looking at the long run. So what happens to these women as they reach the age of over 50? And for starters, this is the percentage of women who experienced a spell of single motherhood um, sometime before they were 50. And you can see, actually, the United States is quite high. It's 32.8%. Scandinavia is the only place that's older. Um, interesting, every other country except the United States in the Health and Retirement Survey did ask a question about partnership and cohabitation. We didn't want to go there for this survey. So we have no data on partnership in the United States. So it's a really um, big um, weakness of our data when I start to show you this, although it turns out um, as a secret, and it doesn't make very much difference. So on the other side are the percentage of people who didn't have partners. So you can see that during this time, um, there were people, um, the prevalence of single motherhood is smaller if you count cohabiting partners, um, but it's still, still pretty high. Um, so the outcomes that we're going to look at are activities of daily living, instrumental activities um, and limitations, um, and self-rated health. And here, what I'm showing you is a model by region. So we're looking at the US, <coughs> England, and then six regions within, um, four regions within um, Europe, Scandinavia, Western Europe, Southern Europe, and Eastern Europe. And model one does not control for household income and wealth. And you see that the risk of having um, an, an activity of daily living limitation later in life um, based on whether you had a single mother episode in earlier life is about 1.27, so it's 27% higher in the United States. It's actually higher in England. And actually, um, we thought, I sort of thought, well, the US will be the worst in this. But actually, the UK comes out consistently as the worst. And interestingly enough, Scandinavia ranks right up there. The countries where you have lower risks are Western and Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, for this, which have actually very negligible risks attached with being single moms. Now, the second model actually controls for household income and wealth at the time of the survey, not actually when these women were single moms. And you see that accounts for a huge part of the association in the United States. So basically, what we take away from this is that um, income, the lack of income, is that in the United States, single moms are very poor. And that actually accounts for a lot of the association between single motherhood in the United States. But it doesn't account for it in these other countries. And just to drive it home a little bit more, here are the three outcomes. If you were a single mother for a longer time, you have a much greater risk. 14 plus years is the red. It relates to all outcomes. 
Um, if you were a single mother due to divorce, which is the red lines, that is the one associated with the worst health outcomes, um, followed by non-marital childbearing, um, and the lower one is widowhood. And finally, I want to say that single motherhood um, experience was most health damaging in England, and we can talk about that, next in the US and Scandinavia, and then in Western Europe, with no significant associations in Southern Europe. And we could speculate about why that is and talk about it. Longer duration of single motherhood was most harmful. That is, if you were a single mom for a year or two, it didn't matter that much. But if you were a single mom for 15 or 16 or 17 years, with um, 18 being kind of a high point, um, you, you have that. And part of our thinking is that it's actually Part of what's harmful is, is the long, constant exposure. It's sort of like the drip, drip, drip of how hard life is when you're managing, juggling so many things and fundamentally alone doing that. Um, and divorced and single mothers um, and those at younger ages were at greater risk. Now I want to spend just a few minutes and talk about the maternity leave um, benefits. This is a paper um, that we just actually published. Um, also from work from National Institute of Aging. And here we looked at European maternity leave policies over a long period of time. So maternity leave policies came into play in Europe um, in the even late 50s. Some of them in Sweden were even earlier, but through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, there was a lot of variation in maternity um, leave policies. We know that maternity leave policies are related to wage level and growth, to the career prospects to labor market attachment, that is, it keeps women in, at least short-term um, maternity benefits, not necessarily three or four or five years, but three months, six months kind of maternity leave benefits. Um, it's positively related to newborn's health. And our idea was, well, if you didn't have access to maternity leave, was there some kind of a scarring effect? Um, and this, again, looks at data from SHARE, which I spoke to you about, this European study of many countries. And um, it looks at 30,000 um, women in these, men and women in these studies. We only look at the women. And we looked at their working history and their fertility history. And in this case, we looked at their mental health um, outcomes. And we have a very extensive and strong measure to look at maternity benefits that was developed by Anne Gauthier. Um, and covers this period from 1960 to 2010. And we're going to look at maternity leave that is paid wages um, per week. So we're going to look up the added numbers of paid weeks of leave. And to show you the variation, it, it, there actually was quite a lot of variation. Um, finally, we were able to do a difference in difference score and look at the effect on depression of having um, had a child, your first child, at a time when you lived in a country where there was a maternity benefit. And what we found is that there was a 16.2% difference in depression score between low versus high um, countries with full wage weeks with respect to the mean value among women, European working um, women. So from this, we conclude that depression in old age is actually linked to something that happened at a much earlier time, in this case, maternity leave policies, during a critical period of the birth of their first child. And that moving from a maternity leave with limited coverage to one with comprehensive coverage at the birth of the first child reduces depression scores by 16%. We have some potential ideas about mechanisms, potentially postpartum um, stresses and depression or early bonding that allowed women to have healthy relationships with their children going on or unambiguous attachment to work um, might be the mechanisms, but that is the next thing that we're looking at. And finally, I want to say that depression um, is not nothing. Um, if any of you have looked at the labor statistics on the cause of uh, the disease that most um, is most costly for labor, it actually is depression. And um, what we've done here is estimate some of these costs. Now, these are European data, so you're going to see them in euros, which you can devalue as you wish. Um, so <laughs> older people um, with depression actually use more health services, more home care, and assisted living than older people without depression. We know that. 
Um, the mean direct health care costs in old age per patient were 5,241 euros per year for depressed individuals compared to 3,648 per year for non-depressed individuals, corresponding to a 30% difference. So cost-benefit analyses should really take into account the potential loss in women's welfare in old age, resulting from the diminishing the comprehensiveness of maternity leave benefits 20 or 30 years earlier in their life. Thank you.